Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or of others, oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Well, I love the story of the Madonna of Monte Virginia and her compassion for same-sex lovers who were victimized by the hatred and prejudice of religious people. St. Mary, on the side of love. Now, sometimes, particularly Protestants will ask, well, Catholics too, because they're not used to such affirming messages. And Protestants don't know that anything of any uh, interest happened between the uh, early second century and Martin Luther. And so they're, they're surprised by this 13th century story also. And so um, they'll ask, did, did that really happen? Do you think that's true? Well, those are two different questions. <laughs> I don't know if it happened, but I certainly believe it's true. And that's my answer for almost any question you can talk to, ask me about any sacred story in or out of the Bible. Uh, do I believe snakes ever talked? No, but I believe the, the, the creation myth has truths uh, to teach us. Do I believe that every animal in the world went on two by two to take a cruise together? No, but I believe there's value and truth in the story. Do I believe that, that uh, Jonah took up residence in a fish? Not literally, and yet the story is very true in so many ways. And so, I don't know, did, did the, the blessed mother from beyond our reality make the sun to shine to, to spare two people? I don't know. But I know that the story talks about an unconditional love, a love that will not condemn love, a love that is greater than religiosity and dogma and tradition, and that is 100% true. I believe in that love, and I preach that love. And so, yes, St. Mary on the side of love, true story, whether it happened or not. In Judaism, kindness and hospitality are highly valued, and the Torah commands, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not love your neighbor as much or as little as you love yourself, because really, we're doing that anyway. People who don't feel good about themselves find things wrong with other people to tear them down so they feel a little bit better by comparison. So we're already loving people as little as we love ourselves. We don't need a commandment to do that. So that's what the commandment is. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as if they were you. Love your neighbor the way you would want to be loved. Love your neighbor the way you would hope to, if you don't believe you deserve that sort of love, that you at least would hope to deserve that sort of love. Love your neighbor as if she were you, or at least part of you, because she is. Real love looks like kindness and compassion and appreciation and equitable treatment. We are part of a web of existence. We are all connected to the one source and to one another through this web. We, we are all made from the same stuff. We are made from earth dust and stardust and fairy dust. And it's all the same. We are, we, we are light and water and dust and air and energy. And we're part of this greater whole. We are one with life. And we are literally part of one another. Love your neighbor as if he is part of you, because he is, she is, they are. And our scripture tells us, God is love. Not loving, but love itself. God is love, and love is kind. Love your neighbor, but who is your neighbor? This is always the tricky point, isn't it? If I can find a loophole, well, yeah, I'm going to love my friends, I'm going to love my family, or some of my family, not the people who married in, and not the middle sibling, and not, and, and not the one really crotchety grandparent, but some of my family. Some of my family I'm going to love, and my friends, and my spouse, and my dog, but someone's not my neighbor, and that's who I get to hate. So who is your neighbor? And Jesus told the story to answer that very question. 
The question isn't who do I get to stop considering my neighbor. The question is how can I be a neighbor to absolutely everyone? And so Jesus tells a story he imagines a Samaritan, someone his community had a prejudice against. And the Samaritan is traveling and finds a man who's been robbed and beaten and left for dead. Religious people walk past the man without offering any aid. A priest and a Levite, they work in the temple and they can't touch uh, bloody things and they can't touch corpses and, and go into the temple and they're on their way to work. So this man who looks dead might be dead, and if they touch the dead corpse and they can't go into the temple, and they've got chapter and verse to support this, so they just walk on by. Following the dogma, following the letter of the law, having verse and verse, chapter and verse to, to proof text it, to justify it. And so they let someone suffer in the name of religiosity. But the outcast, the queer, the other, the one people who had been taught to hate, showed kindness and compassion. He stopped, checked on the person, saved his life. Who was neighborly in the story, Jesus asks? Well, obviously the Samaritan, and not the religious folk who would have told you chapter and verse why dogma dictated they walk on by. They were following the Bible, y'all, and they weren't getting it wrong. They were doing, they were following exactly what it said. They were following the letter of the law. They were being faithful and in their faithfulness and in their rightness and in their correctness and, and in their willingness to do everything exactly to the letter. Someone was dying. Someone was suffering. Someone was hurting. Their religiosity did not ease the pain. It was contributing to it. And Jesus doesn't think that's the way it ought to be. It's obviously the Samaritan and not the religious folk who was neighborly to the hurting person. The Samaritan shows love over legalism. And our scripture tells us God is love. And so Jesus says, be like the Samaritan. Who is the neighbor? The one who showed kindness. Go and do likewise, he said. Be like the Samaritan. The Apostle Paul wrote to one of the churches he helped start, love is patient and kind and never rude. It's not self-seeking or quick-tempered. Love doesn't brood over injury and it bears all things and believes the best and hopes for everything good and endures all things. Love never fails. And our scripture tells us God is love. Love is kind. Love is patience. Love isn't self-seeking, praise me, praise me, praise me. That's exactly what we were taught to believe about God. But if God is love, that is the opposite of love. Praise me, praise me, praise me. And if you please me, I may do something for you. Or I'm out to get you anyway, but if you please me, I may change my mind and save you from the wrath that I threw at you the first time. Whatever. It's incomprehensible. God is love and love is kind. Healthy love doesn't keep score. Well, that just blows everyone's theology out of the water, doesn't it? Healthy love, God is love, and love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't punish. Love doesn't seek revenge. Love doesn't wish harm. Love is never cruel. Love is never cruel. And P.S., love is never cruel. And God is love. All things being even, here's what I believe in. Nothing matters more than love. Anti-drag bills aren't loving. They aren't necessary. They aren't helpful. They certainly aren't being neighborly to drag performers, and they aren't loving drag artists as ourselves. Bathroom bills don't keep anyone safe. In fact, they put transgender people in greater danger. Bathroom bills aren't born of neighborly affection or loving kindness. The good Samaritan would let a person pee in peace. And P.S., the Good Samaritan wouldn't choke someone to death on a train for being obnoxious. Let's hear the Good Samaritan story one more time. I know I just told it to you, but let's hear it one more time. A trans man was walking home one night and stopped at a convenience store to use the restroom and buy a soda. And when he came out of the restroom, two guys were waiting for him, accused him of using the wrong toilet, and dragged him outside and beat him senseless. They robbed him and left him for dead. A fundamentalist minister walking in to get a black plastic-covered magazine <laughs> uh, 
stepped right over the assaulted person. Later, a New Age guru walked by and thought, I wonder what was in his consciousness that attracted such bad luck. Doesn't that make your ass want to dip a snuff? <laughs> and she kept walking. But a drag diva, leaving the bar, was on the way home, and she saw the man crumpled on the ground, and she called 911 and held the man's hand until help arrived. And she went to the ER with him in case, in his diminished state, he needed help navigating the intake process because transgender people often have difficulty accessing medical care anyway. And after they patched him up and released him, the drag angel ordered an Uber and paid to get him home. Who is the neighbor in the story? Who showed love? The preacher could quote the Bible, probably even get it right. Not the spirit of it, but the words. And the New Ager knew a commodified version of the law of attraction. But the drag queen was love. That is, the drag queen was God in action. The drag queen was an example of incarnation. Jesus says, be like the drag queen. <laughs> Scripture and sacraments and hymns are all fine if they are in the service of love. But when we love them rather than people, P.S., that's called idolatry, when we love them rather than people and use them as excuses to not love people, we've lost the plot. And what's the plot? It's love, Mary. It's love, just like in the story of Mary. People who were trying to hide their sexuality, P.S., hugging and kissing on the way to Mass isn't the best way to hide, but whatever. People breaking the rules of the, of, of the institution, but sharing the joy and the reality and the beauty of love. And this moves the heart of Mary to save them from the evils of religiosity. When religion becomes demonic, here comes love to save the day. Love is the plot. Just love, kind, compassionate, never cruel, all-inclusive, unconditional, never-ending love. We sing of love, we read about love, we share a love feast, and then we go out and practice love in the world, and love is kind. If it's not love, it's not God, and if it's not kind, it's not love. Oh, what's love got to do, got to do with everything? Tina, everything, and she knew that in real life. Christianity, Paulianity, Churchianity, flag anity, weapon anity, racism anity, I'm tired of all of it. It's time for loveyanity. That's the message and mission of Jesus, love. If Christianity has taken us so far away from love, then, then let's be done with Christianity, not love, not done with gathering together, not done with studying, not done with searching, not done with loving, not done with serving, just done with the restraints of religiosity and rules and traditions and dogma that let people lie on the side of the road dying instead of showing loving compassion. We need the kind of love that will stand up. Instead of saying, in the name of religion, we're going to exclude and hurt and demonize and demoralize and, and dehumanize these people, we need to stand on the side of love and say, no, that's not loving, that's not kind, that's not compassionate, that's not just. And in the name of Jesus, we will not stand for it. If that makes us not Christian, good, but we are good followers of Jesus. message and mission of Jesus. Love. The kingdom of God is the anti-empire. And guess what? The religion of the state is part of the empire. And what we want is the kingdom of God, which is built on love in service of the God that is love. What's our job? Our mission? Our raison d'etre? It's love. It's love, Mary. Just love. And this is is the good news. Amen. Amen.